Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who was told as a child in horrifyingly graphic detail about a sex act called Hunting the Woolly Mammoth, and he has still not recovered. Mr. Lord Popgarden, Lauren! <laughs> You are a disturbed, disturbed individual, my friend. <laughs> oh, what's up, Ren Adams? How are you? I'm doing great, man. Doing great. Glad to be back with you. Another great week for gaming. Many, many things to talk about. Actually, I played three games uh, this I, past week, which is a, I a also rare played three games. Uh, I also played three games, actually. Yeah. Mm. One of which is going to surprise you, I think. Uh, hope, hopefully, it's Metal Gear Solid Five. That would surprise the shit out of me. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's not surprising. Okay, so it's not that surprising. Is what no, you're it's not that surprising. All right. Well, I'll tell you what is also not that surprising is the fact that Far Cry is releasing a new game set in prehistory. And the reason that's not surprising is because they teased us all to hell about it, and everybody guessed it. But we actually know for certain now that Far Cry Primal is on the way, and we have an official reveal trailer that shows off the setting and the world and some of the things you will be getting up to, which may or may not include hunting woolly mammoth. And also, I think the trailer does a really excellent job of explaining why the woolly mammoth went extinct and also why we had to make the saber-toothed tiger go extinct, and that is because of food competition. And uh, the trailer actually lays all that out, in addition to... Uh, other uh, sundry things. Lauren? Yes. Uh, you're a bigger Far Cry fan than I am. Historically. What did you think of Far Cry Primal? Uh, you know, honestly, I wasn't that turned on, Brent. Uh, I don't know I don't know how you felt about it, but there, there was something... First of all, there was something very... There was something very odd about the look of the game. The color schema I didn't really love uh, about the game. Oh, well, um, you have to remember, like, back in those times, though, you know, everything was sort of sepia with really saturated colors. I mean, it's just, <laughs> that's right. It's a story that's fact. Right. I mean, come they on. Call, that's, I forgot they set this in the sepia age. Yes, they did. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I need to see more. I mean, I got to be honest. I'm a... We've talked about this a lot over the last few weeks. This, you know, people have written on the website about open world fatigue or whatever, and... Um, uh, I certainly there's upcoming open world games that I have every intention of playing, but there's something I never f- finished. I got maybe halfway into Far Cry Four, um, and so right now I'm not drawn to this. I love the idea of um, you know less guns. Necess- you know, I mean, I'm partic- you, we've talked about. I'm I'm interested in. I loved like Turok and that sort sort of uh, world, and I'd love to see some dinosaur stuff. I don't know if that's going to translate to the primal area. I feel like I need to see more. I just my initial response was I wasn't blown away. Okay, well, I don't. You? Dis- I don't necessarily disagree with that assessment. I mean, the main thing that I was interested in is just the fact that it is a game set in this, you know, this this ancient history, right. tens of thousands of years, which ago, is not a common timeline, setting. Which is not a common setting, and you're just kind of being interested in history, and 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 I love the idea of kind of going back into this e- era of prehistory where. You know, we have we have some idea of of what life must have been like and and what our species must have been like during that time. You know, from the the few pieces of archaeological evidence of cave paintings and, and you know, just the the things that we are able to to kind of piece together before we actually started developing language and recording history ourselves. I'm fascinated by that era in our history. And I think it's cool that a game is exploring that. Whether or not that actually translates into a game I want to play, I don't know. But I'm glad that they did it. I'm glad it exists. I wish them the best. Uh, that's, I, that's very well said, and I would agree with everything you just said. Uh, let's talk about the Fallout 4 Limited Edition Crate yes. from Loot Crate. Now, that's right. I do not subscribe to Loot Crate. Nor do I. I kind of wish I did. But uh, well, one, well, then why don't you talk about this then? Uh, sure. Loot Crate is a... If you guys aren't familiar with Loot Crate, go check it out. It's a really interesting idea. It's I think it's something along the lines of about 15 bucks a month. And you get literally these random Loot Crates every month. You have no idea what's going to be in them. And they're typically centered around, uh, you know, your general geekery, uh, games, comic books, that sort of thing, superheroes. Uh, and so, for example, like one month they'll have... Uh, they'll do one about spies and they send you stuff from the Spy versus Spy comic and maybe something that's related to Splinter Cell and it can be... 
you know, weird things like little toys or lunch boxes sometimes or little just little doodads. And they're they're really they're always really interesting. Uh, and as I said, it's about fifteen bucks a month. Well, Bethesda, uh, in their infinite wisdom and wisdom it is, I believe, uh, got together with Loot Crate, made love to them, and had a baby, <laughs> and decided, <laughs> a baby and decided to Fallout do Four Loot Crate. Decided to do a Fallout Four specific Loot Crate, which apparently I didn't know about this the first go around, Brent. Mm. Uh, but apparently they did this uh, a few weeks ago, and they so there's seven items. There's 150 plus dollars in value, and it's a uh, hundred bucks US. Uh, for the loot crate and there, there's a limited amount of them uh and uh but apparently they did this a couple of weeks ago brent and they sold out like immediately and so they have returned i don't know at the time of this recording by the time you hear this it's possible they will be sold out as we're recording they're still available uh, i apologize if you don't listen to our show till friday then that's your own damn fault uh, <laughs> but uh they they are available again and i think for those of you that are interested in um uh, in Fallout 4, this might be very, very tempting for you. Uh, I I think it's it's interesting. I I don't I don't know. Like I've never really gotten into a, a good, like the idea of the loot crate. The idea of this, you know, you just sort of give them money and they give you sort of like a curated collection of things. Things yeah. you know, each month. Like that's kind of interesting. Like just sort of the surprise of it or whatever. But like I, I'm at a place where I'm like starting to get rid of like all of those just sort of like random little doodads and things. That I have, you know, right. just because I've been collecting them for a long time now, and uh, and it's it's starting to it started to be one of those things where it's like, oh well, I need to invest in like an eighty dollars shelf system to keep all of my little all of your doodads. And, dads, and then yes. I start to like, I wonder about yes. the diminishing returns of how much I'm really enjoying them. That's a true story. But let me tell you, Brent, for this one. So if you're a Fallout person, though, so they say there's seven items, most of which can't be found anywhere else. Right. It's a one-time crate, so you don't have to su- subscribe to Loot Crate just to do the Fallout 4 crate. Right. And the, the two example items they give you that are in the crate are a Vault 111 hoodie and an exclusive dog meat plushie. Which is pretty cool. And Both of those, I think, if you're, in, if you're, if you're into uh, Fallout, uh, yeah. That, those are both pretty those cool. Those are no-brainers. I mean, okay, yeah. like, let's be honest. If they were doing like a fucking Red Dead Redemption Loot Crate, those like 100 bucks, I'd be getting it. Probably, uh, yes. I, I, I would mean, agree with know, that, like, I yes. Can, I, I can admit to myself that in spite of... You know, my uh, in spite of my statement just a moment ago, I'd be getting that mother. <laughs> so anyway, I just think this is a very cool thing for Fallout fans. I, I if you're interested, go check it out. Uh, I, I hope this gets a lot of support because I'd love to see other uh, other IPs do this. Uh, you say that now, and yet that could go wrong. That could go wrong on us, Lauren, <laughs> very quickly. Anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about Allison Road, which yes. I have heard is the indie answer spiritual successor to PT. And Silent Hills, which of course uh, Konami is not doing because they're too busy building slot machines or whatever the <laughs> fuck they do these days. That's right. Um, anyway, interesting story with Allison Road. They had a Kickstarter, Kickstarter that was going very, very well, and and well, if, if, very well. I wouldn't say very, very okay, well. Look, they were eight all days. All right, so one very well. Okay, I get it, Lauren. Anyway, it was, well, it was going okay. My point is that they had a Kickstarter was that was that was going okay. It looked like they were probably going to get their funding. They were asking for like I think like three hundred and three hundred and fifty ish. Yeah, it was done. I think it was initially in British pounds, so right. it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it was some weird number okay, in dollars. So like three hundred fifty thousand space bucks or thereabout. And right. they had about two eighty eight. They they announced was it today? Today. It was today. They announced yeah. today that they are canceling uh their, their their Kickstarter for the game. But those sons of bitches. Oh wait a minute. It's There's not more. bad news because they've in fact found a publisher. And that's why they are canceling the Kickstarter, because they now have somebody standing behind them that's gonna allow them to develop the game. And uh, and if you've not seen anything from Allison Road, it's a good looking game, uh, particularly given how how indie a game it is. I mean, it's a very small group of people working on this thing, but it it looks quite nice. It does. It looks very very interesting. So yeah, Team Seventeen uh, picked up uh, publishers behind the Worms franchise picked up this IP. They were and actually it says they were around two hundred thousand dollars short of their goal. I didn't realize they were that far from their goal. Uh, with only eight or nine days left, but they, uh, yeah, Team Seventeen picked them up, and it looks like this game will be coming to market, and it's awesome. I highly recommend if you haven't seen Allison Road, go out there and Google it and check out the YouTube video. I'm sure you can find it, the one that was up on the Kickstarter 
Uh, it is very, very interesting looking. I think, uh, I think just to clarify, I think you, you might have misread that. I think what they're actually saying there in that Polygon I'm sorry, article yes. <laughs> is that they had raised about 225000 out of the 300 385 right? They were 106. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. $160,000 short. If only, if only those clarifications could come as fast as that one did every show, Lauren. That's um, right. All right. So congrats and congratulations to them. We look forward to seeing what they do. Uh, it's, it, it's a fucking cool, I, I mean, like, I'm just down with like how, how much attention they're getting into, like, or how much attention they're paying to like the photorealism aspect of it and, and how really, really good the game looks. I, I think it's going to be a great for immersion, particularly if you play it on Oculus Rift, as you say, by the way, yep. can see the devs doing <laughs> in their <laughs> Kickstarter right. video. Yes. All right. Last up in the garage this week, Sean Murray, who of course we all know as the getting slightly less awkward with every public appearance uh, dude from uh, from Hello Games uh, working on uh, No Man's Sky. He made an appearance on The Late Show, formerly uh, with David Letterman, now, of course, hosted by Stephen Colbert, and shows off No Man's Sky to Mr. Colbert, who gets to name uh, a breed of bison and some mole. And a planet. A planet. A star he system. Named a planet. Star That's system. Right. Yes. The, the, what was it, like the Colbert cluster or something like that? Anyway, but uh, the point is that... I think it was called the Colbert hole. I don't know. Yeah, remember. maybe that was it. But it was very cool to see, you know, to see this uh, get showed off in that venue, a late night talk show. The crowd seemed to be pretty happy about it. Still no release date, Lauren. Still yeah. no release date. <laughs> but since 2015 is slowly ticking away on us here, we're assuming that the release date has got to be sometime really soon. That's, yeah, it's still no release date, but... Uh, man, I think this is really cool. We have so obviously, as you mentioned, you know, uh, Jimmy Fallon has been doing has been doing video game stuff since he started. Yeah. Uh, um, Conan, uh, obviously, Conan, Conan O'Brien makes done, fun of video games yeah. on a regular basis. More, more making fun of himself. Uh, yes, in relation to but video games. Uh, I think it's Jimmy I think, Kimmel so more th- making fun of video games. Video gamers. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So I, no, but I think this is awesome in a lot of ways. Number one, I think it's great that Stephen. I love Stephen Colbert, and I think it's great that out of the gate he's got somebody on with video games. Uh, early on in his tenure in that show. And so it, I would assume that he will continue to do that. Number two, um, I appreciated uh, the, it, I thought it was relatively speaking, a very intelligent discussion uh, compared to others that we have seen. Yeah. Um, uh, he didn't, you know, really mock uh, the game in any way, which I thought was great. Um, and number three, you I thought also, was- You can also tell he's down. You can tell he's down with his astronomy work, you know, because he's you know, he was using some key phrases like the local group and things like that. Yes. If you watch like Cosmos or listen to anything like Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast and stuff like that, he's using some terms and things, uh, you know, from that uh, that from actual area astronomy, of science. Yes. Yeah. Um, but also, I was really excited, Brent, about the fact that they had somebody on for No Man's Sky, and uh, uh, you know, independent develop independently developed game, and yes, albeit one with. Uh, a lot of attention. It's still an indie game, and it's still a small team. Yeah. This isn't the Witcher threes or the uh, Call of Duties or the Battlefields of the world. Yeah. This is a small game, and I thought that was just just fantastic. I agree. I, I thought it was really cool, and I, I thought I thought Sean Murray was great. He you know he did yeah. he did a great job of far less uh, awkward of, as you said. Yeah, I mean like like it's obvious that he's gotten used to this whole sort of public uh, this whole sort of you know public speaking and and you know showing the game off in a big venue like that. It's obvious how far he's come since I think the first time we saw him at uh, mm-hmm. was it VGX. Um, I don't remember or, what the initial show. Yeah, I, th- I think it was one of the Game Trailers uh, Video Game Awards, the one that went terribly wrong. Uh, anyway, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is a joke yeah, about which is the which same one. Right. Yes. Anyway, but uh, it, it was cool. It, it was a neat segment. I remain super super interested for the game, and it was cool to see the game get some love on uh, on Cold Beer Show on national TV. It was indeed, Brandon. I believe if I read Sean Murray's uh, Twitter right, his next stop is Fox News. That's great. Just make sure and bring Jeff Keeley with you. It's too much sex in Sean's game. <laughs> it's an entire universe, eighteen quadrillion planets having sex, producing <laughs> life, and we're just letting our kids play this. <laughs> I don't know why, but the phrase "mass erect" just jumped into my head. Oh my god! <laughs> How did that not come up back in the Listen, day? Listen, uh, Lauren, I wanted to talk to you. By the way, uh, I've been thinking about doing a, a parody porn film of Mass Effect called "Mass Erect," and I want to get you to uh, to help me out with it here. Okay, that's fine. As long as that's fine, Brent. As long as I can be Commander Shepard. <laughs> Ha, 
All right, Brent, we are back in the clubhouse, and before, as usual, we jive it. <laughs> we jive? All right, Brent, we are back in the clubhouse, and as usual, before we dive into this week's topic, why don't you tell us about the poll? Uh, absolutely. I would love to tell you about the poll. Uh, last week, we were talking, of course, about the sag after looming threat of a potential voice actor strike uh, so that the, uh, the people who do voice acting in video games can uh, can try to uh, to get some considerations that they think are important. We asked you, what's your read on the looming threat of a voice actor strike? Coming in in last place with 20%, you said the voice actors should back down. They aren't as critical to games as they are to film or television. Uh, narrowly eclipsing that in third place, 21% of the vote, you said game publishers need to agree to their terms to prevent a strike. The number two answer with 27% was a strike isn't going to cripple the game industry. The publishers aren't going to budge. And the number one answer with 33% was the publishers are playing hardball. It's a negotiating tactic to reach a compromise. Thank you very much for sounding off on this one, for voting in the poll. We yep, do want, a lot of great comments this week. Yeah, there, there certainly was. It generated a lot of discussion. I, I yep. do want to pause here for just a second and actually return to that because we have an update, and then we just need to, to clarify a couple of points. So number one, do, do, uh, as do, of do, right do, do. now, the uh, the union, SAG-AFTRA, has announced the results of their strike vote, and uh, they have said that uh, a strike has been authorized at this point. Now, this doesn't mean that they've called a strike. It simply means that the union has been authorized by its membership and its board to uh to to do to do a strike if they feel that they need to so that's uh that's kind of where the story sits right now in addition to that uh last week we talked although this is not the 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 only thing that's on the table as far as the union is concerned but the main thing that we talked about was the residuals payments and we were really talking about residuals you know we, we kind of explained how they work uh traditionally in film and television and it was pointed out to us by uh, a couple of people that that is not the same structure that uh, that's being proposed here. What is what is being proposed in regards to residuals uh, in the way of video games is the actors uh, would want the ability to get back in payments that would start kicking in at two million copies sold, and then they would that would step up and they would get additional disbursements every two million copies up to eight million. So. As opposed to just a, you know, just like a straight up, uh, you know, percentage or, you know, whatever, like whatever the profits are, it is a, a different structure that's that's being proposed here. And we just wanted to uh, we wanted to spell that out because we didn't spell it out last week. And obviously, if you hadn't gone and, and read the article and everything, then uh, we would we would not blame you if uh, if if the discussion were a little bit uh, a little bit confusing in that regard. And I guess the other thing that might just be uh, worth saying here, because we kind of, we mentioned last week, oh, well, the residuals are not the only thing that they're after, but we didn't really kind of talk about the other things that they were after. But just to, uh, just to let you in on what those are, if you haven't read them at this point, one of the things that the actors are concerned about uh, are, are long recording sessions that, uh, that they deem to be vocally stressful. In, in other words, uh, sessions where they are being asked to do something very stressful for long periods of time, which could result in, uh, in in damaging their voice, which is obviously their livelihood, and they're concerned about that, and so they want to uh, they want to restrict those intense vocal sessions. That they they want to have a time limit that that you can do those in. Uh, I think two hours is what sticks in my mind. And then the other thing is uh, they want uh, they want to have stunt coordinators on the on the stage for uh, any kind of motion capture gags that are going to require that, you know, they've talked about, you know, like at being asked to do sword fights with wooden swords and kind of feeling like, Hey, gee, I might, I might poke somebody's eye out doing this. There's, there's one anecdote I saw, uh, somewhere about, uh, I, I think it was like one of the game developers, like hooked themselves up to a wire rig and yanked themselves across the room and, and hurt themselves pretty considerably. Uh, so anyway, stunt coordinator. That sounds like a dumb thing to do. Well, you know, the thing, the thing that's kind of interesting about this is like basically like what, what the actors are asking for, uh, you know, like all these considerations and stuff. I'm like, man, like I should have fucking gotten a union when I was a kid because this is basically my childhood screaming, right, exactly. doing unsafe things without a stunt coordinator and not getting back in payments for it. That's exactly, you know what exactly, I mean? like, I that's fucking, exactly what I was thinking. Like it makes perfect sense, Brent. I think most of the people <laughs> that are listening to this podcast have uh, uh, understand the need to negotiate for only having to work for two hours at a time. Of course. I mean, that makes perfect sense. And again, as you said, kids and actors everywhere, I think, uh, that do local theater and everything, uh, totally understand the need if I'm going to 
argue or if we're going to play sword fight with you know wooden swords that of course we should have a professional on the scene just to make sure we don't actually bump each other it makes sense it, Brent. it does it makes total sense i, I I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 actually i'm sorely tempted now to start relating some anecdotes of some of the highly <laughs> insane and unsafe things that i did uh, back in college like for special effects making uh, making uh, you know short films and stuff in college like oh yes. we have to uh, we have to show that, like this uh, this gun is like shooting at this mirror how do we do that it's like how about you hold the mirror and i shoot it with this bb gun it's like how about some safety glasses we forgot that sounds to, like we forgot to bring safety glasses better just cover your eyes eh, go ahead <laughs> uh, like yeah no and please no i'm sure Don't that there's that, a kids. few people out there Don't that are that. like shut up Lord. I'm, I'm totally kidding i absolutely um support the people's rights to ask for uh to advocate for on their own behalf and ask for better working conditions i don't know all of the details of all of the things but uh certainly i'm please know that i'm totally totally kidding when i make those jokes i'm not i don't actually think that they're nancy's for not uh for asking for this i and now i've insulted all the nancy's in the world oh, i'm just gonna stop yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna stop right the now show just the show just dive bombed on us right there but anyway, uh, if you want to go and read this Game Informer article called The Potential Voice Actor Strike Explained, it does a fantastic job of, of going through point by point all of the things that have kind of been discussed and, and also, you know, like why they're being asked for, what the, what the reasoning behind the proposal is, what the conflict over that point might be. It's a really, really great write-up. Very, very helpful. Please go look at it. All right. Now, for this week, Brent. Yes. We have another topic. Uh, this is a video topic, Brent, featuring the one and only, uh, <laughs> one and only Jim Sterling, uh, eloquent, uh, totally non-offensive Jim Sterling, uh, doing one of his episodes from Jim Quisition. We're actually tying this Brent to our ride along this week. We're bringing the ride along into the clubhouse, uh, because it's related. So, uh, the video we're linking to is called enjoy the silence, feel the noise. This was an, uh, uh, video that Jim made, uh, which I think is a fantastic video and please ignore the first, like, I don't know, 90 seconds or so when he's robed and talking about stuff that doesn't necessarily make sense. But essentially, he's talking about... Um, so the, the the catalyst for this conversation or his video was the uh, revelation that Assassin's Creed Syndicate is going to have microtransactions in it. And um, he responded to this and I think got some vitriolic responses to his response to this. And so he kind of is talking about... Um, you know, he got a lot of responses that said, like, man, microtransactions is just not news. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? Yeah. And so his video is a comment on this. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And then I want to go ahead and read the ride along because it ties in. If this is the, the topic this week isn't about microtransactions per se, but it's connected. And so coming from Aaron B., one of our listeners, uh, his ride along went something like this microtransactions, the devilish way of manipulating hundreds of dollars out of a portion of gamers with weak willpower or as the publishers call them, whales, have become extremely prevalent. Metal Gear Solid Five, Halo 5, Street Fighter Five, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and undoubtedly more to come, all feature them, uh, meaning microtransactions, and all are full retail price products with an MSRP of 60 bucks. And now, Konami has the gall to use them this way. And he links to an IGN article that talks about how Konami, this is actually funny to me, Brent, mm. Konami is, uh, and not funny, is actually <laughs> selling for real money. You can buy... Uh, <laughs> FOB or forward operating base, your operating bases in multi uh, in Metal Gear Solid Online. Uh, so, so you can buy insurance for them. And so, if another player attacks your forward operating bases, uh, you can the insurance will protect you from having all of your shit stolen, basically. Yeah. Uh, which to me, and, and I, don't, I don't play a ton of this game, but it sounds like it's kind of a game changer if you ask me. Uh, because I, I, you know what it makes me think of, Brent, is what was the not Clash of Clans, but the game you were playing a lot on mobile, uh, Star Wars um, Commander. Was it Star Wars Commander? I thought there was another one too. But Star Wars Commander, you know, where basically if you could insure those bases against actually being looted mm -hmm. or destroyed if you got attacked, uh, the, to me that would fundamentally change the game. But but anyway, so that's what he's referring to. And he says, where's the line? When does it become too ridiculous for us to take? How bad does it need to get? So I wanted to sort of tie these two things in together, Brent. Right. Um, Starting with what Jim Sterling had to say, which is this, uh, as I said, he, he describes him, uh, what, what is the term he used? Aggressively apathetic? Yes. Um, people that, uh, that uh, and what he means by that is people that have, we've become so desensitized to something like uh, microtransactions in full price games uh, that we become apathetic about it. That, that um, even though we think it's wrong, after it's around for long enough, we accept it as a norm and think this isn't news anymore, it's everywhere, and we sort of become apathetic. And by aggressively apathetic, 
he's saying that that people will actually aggressively go after him and say, look, man, just stop writing about this. It's not news. Stop being such a dick. Stop whining about it. Everyone's doing it. It's not news anymore. And his response is, fuck you. If we don't keep talking about it, it's never going to change. And just the fact that it's everywhere doesn't make it right, essentially. Yes. Would you agree with that characterization? I, agree. I think I think that's that's exactly the point that he's making, and I think it's a worthwhile point to make. It's an easy trap to fall into. I, I think you know we all have it at, at various times uh, because it can. Uh, well, especially like in, in from my perspective, the, the perspective of doing a, a weekly podcast and, and doing you know at least one podcast a week or almost one podcast a week for the last seven years at this point. Yeah. Uh, it, it's one of those things that. You know, you're, you're gonna if you're gonna talk about the the woes of of uh, of you know DLC practices and online passes and season passes and all that kind of stuff, it it can wear you down after a while because it's just like, oh great, we're talking about this again. But I think that what Sterling's saying it makes a lot of sense in that it's important to it's important to fight through that and to keep talking about it because we've shown with online passes and with you know the deus ex augment your pre-order thing that we were just talking about in the last couple of weeks that it can change based on just how vocal we are about it and and also i i think being vocal about it is important but i don't think there's anything more important than how you spend your money and i think that not spending your money on the things that that get your hackles up is is just as important as as letting your talking voice, about it as letting it your is voice absolutely be heard. absolutely it is but there's no question I, you know i agree with uh everything that jim says in this idea of um you you have to keep you know publishers uh other forms of business but publishers in this case are counting on the fact that they will essentially wear you down and eventually uh, you'll stop talking about it. And so, uh, you know, I think this was an important message. I think everybody who listens to this podcast should take eight or nine minutes and watch this particular video that Jim has put together. Actually, and remember when you're... 15, but keep going. 15, well, just watch nine minutes of it. Though. It's, all, <laughs> it's, all, it's all you need, really. Skip the first 90 seconds, watch the middle nine minutes, and fuck the rest of it. No, no, you should, you should actually walk. He's got some very interesting arguments. You should watch all the way through it. Um... Uh, I think it's worthwhile, and I think it's you know I think it's worthwhile to remember as we all of us that are listening, Brent and I on this show, those of you that are listening to the show, you're all people that have imbibed in games media for for probably a long time, and you have seen this conversation everywhere, and probably have grown fatigued at times about it, as I know I have, sure. um, and and maybe even uh, done what Jim is you know talking about with this aggressive ap- apathy, and said you know like just. How much more do we got to hear about this? But I think it's it's important. Jim's message is very important, and it's good to hear. And I also think it's interesting, and I think it it continues to spark conversation, Brent, because I have to say, so when I read about Assassin's Creed Syndicate's uh, microtransactions, my first reaction to them was, eh, so what? I mean, the, it's a single-player game in which, the mo- in, in which the microtransactions allow you to pay to unlock things that you will unlock in the game. So if you don't want to grind or play through the game to get that specific sword or to get that specific outfit or this, you know, car or or cart, I mean, or whatever, um, if you don't want to do that, you can pay them money and unlock that early. And I thought, you know, so what? What do I care if that's how you want to play, Brent? I mean, it's it's a single-player game, and if you would rather pay an extra $5 and shorten your experience to not have to do this one piece of it, then go to town. That's up to you. It's no harm to anybody else. And, and I was sort of like, this is no big deal. Um, and then I read something like what we talked about with the, with the FOBs in, uh, in Metal Gear Solid. And I think, now that sort of fundamentally changes the game. If you and I are direct competitors, and I can pay to, for, for when I loot you and I attack you, I destroy your bases and you lose all your shit. But when you attack me, that's not the case because I spent five extra dollars. Mm-hmm. That changes tactically the game. Well, right? I, I mean, it changes like the balance. I mean, it, you know, it changes game right. mechanics. I agree with you that it would be a pretty. I, I think that it would be a pretty chaotic, uh, you know, kind of kind of game mechanic to introduce. And I don't know. Like I've only I've only dabbled a little bit in, you know, like FOB stuff as far you know as far as like uh, the online portion of Metal Gear Solid Five goes. I'm not you know paying yeah. to insure my base, and if my base gets attacked and my my, my poor security <laughs> detail gets raped. 
and all my stuff gets stolen. Um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I guess we'll cross that bridge. Right, when you I just get told to it. several thousand people that you're unprotected, essentially. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But uh, no, but I, you know, I think it's I, so. And please, before people write in and say, like, I understand that with the FOBs, it's not everything that's protected, and I don't have a nuanced understanding of how that online multiplayer works. I'm just sort of doing it based on what I read in this article. Yeah. And I would like to say, though, about the Assassin's Creed ones, and this is why I think the conversation needs to keep being had. After a while, I started thinking, you know, I don't give a shit how you decide to play the game, Brent. I don't care if you decide to pay for the sword. That's up to you. But then I thought to myself. But my guess is if they're making money off of this, they're going to start to design the game in order to be able to do this. Well, so that's 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 a worthwhile point. Yeah, it's just, you know, like if 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 it if it's here right now, you know, where is the target going to be, you know, next year, the year after? Right. So they're not just designing the game probably just to make a good game, but they're designing it in mind with how can we make microtransactions to make extra money? And that could fundamentally change the design of the game. And that to me feels inappropriate. But you know what? I hadn't thought about that until I really listened to Jim's conversation, and I think it's, it, it, it accentuates why it's important to keep having the conversation. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and, and the, the thing is, I mean, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule for, for, for this kind of thing or not, because I, I'm torn on the one hand, you know, with what you were kind of saying, I, I, I feel kind of like it's not really my business what you know, if somebody is playing Star Wars Commander and they're, you know, tossing $20 a month into that game, you know, just buying stuff or whatever, or, or, or you know, a Fallout shelter or, you know, whatever. But, you know, they're, they're playing one of these games that is supported through microtransactions and they're investing however much money they want to in it. I, I don't know what it's really got to do with me, you know. Um, but that's kind of tempered with, you know, the whole the whole thing of the... The, that's like the freemium model as opposed to the premium model, which is pay $60 for the game and then, you know, get us some microtransactions and all that. And it's like, well, you know, if we want to, if we want to change the situation, then, you know, we, we, at the very least, we have to, we have to tell people, look, you know, we think that there's a problem if you engage in this, if you, if you give the companies, uh, if you give them what they're asking for in these microtransactions, you're encouraging this business model to propagate. And I don't think that we want that. And similar to the, similar to the, like the, the whole pre-order culture, which, you know, I, I think, I think probably one of the healthiest things to come along in recent memory is this really big pushback against pre-orders. That's something that I'm a hundred percent behind. And I'm, I'm very, I, I'm not shy at all about, about uh, sharing that with people and encouraging them to really consider how much they want to pre-order and how much all those bonus bonuses they get for pre-ordering really mean to them in the in the grander scheme of things but as far as like this stuff goes i I don't know i think that i think that the 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 baseline thing that i really fundamentally agree with is that if you pay 60 dollars for the game you ought to get the game and as far as you know like like jacking in like all of these different little things that you can spend five and ten dollars on to enhance the game or whatever I'm not I'm really not interested in any of that. And thus far it hasn't really impacted me in a negative way, you know, because I, I I haven't played a lot of games I can think of uh that employ this model. But like the Metal Gear Solid 5 one is a really interesting one because I'm I'm playing that a lot. I'm very excited about it. And I'm curious how I I'm curious how I'm gonna react uh if if you know if I come up on the on the losing end of one of these FOB things and and the, and the game reminds me, oh, you know, you could have insured your base for, you know, for blah, 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 blah. Uh, I have to say that that seems pretty, that seems pretty insidious to me. You know, the idea that the, the game mechanics allow your stuff to be taken away, but we will allow you to supersede those game mechanics by paying us. For an additional by fee. By paying us money. And I'm like, you know, even though this is a video game, that's pretty much the definition of extortion. Right, but so that's and this is where I go back to Brandon for focusing on not just the the Jimquisition video and the the sort of need to continue to have the conversation regularly, but on the actual practice itself. Yeah. That's where I go back and I say I say even something like in Assassin's Creed where it's completely benign in the context of uh, it affects no other player but yeah. you because it's a single player so, game and it doesn't matter if if I play Assassin's Creed and spend a bunch of money and level up quickly and you grind because you're right. dedicated to not spending more money, 
my my purchasing does not affect your game in any way. Right, and there's no leaderboards or anything yeah. like that. However, I do think it leads fundamentally back to that industry uh, practice. Well, the idea. I mean, I think I, I think you could actually you could look. That's exactly right. I think you could look at Metal Gear Solid Five and that design decision as an extension of what Assassin's Creed is doing, and that's kind of like oh. We can make a lot of money if we offer microtransactions. How else could we offer microtransactions? Oh, what if we offered them insurance yeah. on their, you know, Star Citizen? What if you could insure your vehicles? What if you could insure your FOBs in Metal Gear Solid Five? What else could we design that would allow us to them then uh, offer them services? You know, just stuff that would, you know, be good for them for an additional few dollars. Now, does that mean that you people shouldn't buy if let's I'm making this up, but Saints Row, and I don't know that Saints Row ever did this, but if they offer you a costume pack for two ninety nine so you could dress up your people as, you know, the cast of Barney Miller? Yes. <laughs> yes, take <laughs> That's my right. two ninety nine quick. <laughs> Ninety per- or for example, uh if you wanted to, you know, be able to dress up your Shepard like uh Nathan Drake, should you be able to do that for money? Does that encourage a practices? I don't know. I, I kind of think that you know I, I, designers yeah. begin to look for those opportunities. I, I think I think there's a bit of a gray area there because I, I think I don't know. I mean, I think that you know paying for you know paying for a themed costume pack or something like that seems pretty benign next to uh, next to some of the things that that we're kind of getting into here. So, yeah, I, so I, I, don't, we, I don't I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule to this that that I feel comfortable getting behind. Like no, you know, no microtransactions ever because they're all. You know, they're all leading down this road. I don't know. I, I don't know if I feel that. I think that's that Jim's strong. position with regard to, with, with regard to full-price games. Yeah, but I don't know if I feel uh, that strongly about it. Again, you know, I, what I do feel strongly about, Brent, is that we because should continue really to have like the conversation. The fact that I was able to use a microtransaction to get the goddamn Warhorse in Red Dead Redemption, which was the only way I was going to get that son of a bitch. You used a microtransaction yeah, for that? Yeah, like You pre-ordered from the wrong no, place. No, I, I didn't pre-order the game at all. and That was your problem right yeah, there. You should have pre-ordered uh, from the, wherever I pre-ordered it from. Fucking GameStop, probably. And... But you know, like I, I paid like you know the fucking dollar whatever it was eventually to get the you know to get the warhorse. But that does beg the question, Brent. So why did you wanted the warhorse because the warhorse was faster and it was better for you to get across the map, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So it does beg the question: if the concept of microtransactions didn't exist, and they recognized that people would want a faster and better, qu- quicker, more agile way to get across the map, would they have designed it so that you could have achieved? Uh, you could have acquired the warhorse sooner in the game to make the gameplay more fun for you. I don't know. I mean, that, that that's getting into a like a level of woulda, shoulda, coulda that like I, I don't know if it's particularly practical or helpful. I mean, it's it's like you know people. It's like people arguing against piracy, saying, "Well, you know, if there was no way to access torrents or you know get albums through YouTube, then you know this album would have sold 19 million copies." And it's like, well, no, because the people who are listening to it through those venues are doing it probably because most of them because they don't have the money to pay for the album. So just because they couldn't have gotten it for free doesn't mean they would have spent money on it. You know, it's, it's like... I, no, I, but I disagree. You, you I think into, that, I don't think that's a good analogy. I, nah, see, I disagree with you completely, man, and here's why. Because I think that... I, I don't think it's a good analogy because in your analogy, those people that couldn't afford the, the music would have just not listened to the music. Well, that, I mean, right? that's the claim, is what I'm saying. Right, right, right. And so, but in the case, of, in the context of, uh, say, the War Horse, for example, the microtransaction... Um, if if people did not su- people could choose to not support microtransaction at all, right? And if people didn't support them and give their money, they would they would stop existing, right? They wouldn't be there. If people weren't buying them, they wouldn't be yeah, there. I, I, I and if they right, and if the, if they weren't there, uh, and uh, what you would have in the reviews would probably be something more like you know I really liked Red Dead Redemption, but by halfway through the game, it was just so fucking slow getting across the map. That all, and so at the end, and so when I got to ninety percent through the game, I got this warhorse finally, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Fuck, where was this? Where was this the whole twenty game? hours ago?" Right, and that would reflect in reviews, and people would look at that when they do play testing. And yeah, but, I mean, do you know what that, I mean? That, that's like, I mean, that's literally like you know, like a person's philosophical glasses half full, glasses half empty. One person gets the warhorse and says, "This is fantastic. Now I can get around even faster." And another person says, "This fucking sucks. I was going so slow before I had this." Even though it's the exact same, they, they've experienced the exact same thing. They can respond to it in completely different ways. Well, that's of course true. So people experience things differently. So, it, but so again, like my point is, like you know, going down that path, I, I don't know. I don't. I, I just 
I don't know. Like, I don't see a lot of utility in it personally. Do you? So, uh, do you? Do you not think that developers? Like, do you think it's too far fetched to think that, for example, Rockstar might deliberately say, "Let's not give the war horse till further on in the game," and that way, people who are more interested in going faster will will maybe kick down the two bucks. Do you think that that's far fetched to think that that's an actual conversation in a game development studio? No, I mean, I'm I'm sure that you know conversations like that happen all the time. But I mean, like you know, Rockstar by and large, I think, has done DLC about as good as it can be done. I didn't remember that you could buy the War Horse, and frankly, I feel like you're a cheater now. <laughs> you're the one who ordered from GameStop, you motherfucker. That's really what... Yes, but that was legitimate. That was fair and square. I ordered it, and I got the pre-order bonus. You paid to win, Brent. So basically, I don't even think you're a real Red Dead fan at this yeah, point. Yeah, that's right. All my creds are up are for up now. All right, guys, we're going to hit the road and talk about some of the games we've been playing this week, which, uh, as we said earlier, it's actually been quite a bit. So let's get right to it. Lauren? Let's not get right to it, Brent, because before Can we do, <laughs> I want to I want to give a, a couple of thank yous to folks. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been given a couple of gifts on Steam from two of our listeners. Uh, first of all, uh, I, and I did not ask them if I could say their name on air, so I'm just going to thank them for the games, and I appreciate it very, very much. I got a gift of a game called Layers of Fear, mm-hmm. uh, which is a horror game that's out there, which I cannot wait to play. Uh, I'm going to try and get get to that, both of these games, in the next couple of months uh, right now, still playing other stuff, obviously. But uh, Layers of Fear and A Beginner's Guide, the uh, sequel, for, not sequel, but the second, the next game from the makers of The Stanley Parable. A uh, couple of gifts uh, over Steam, and just thank you guys very oh, much for that. Oh, that's super cool. Super, super cool. Yep. Uh, all right, Brent. So the first game we're going to talk about that we were both playing this mm-hmm. week, that I think a lot of people were playing, and there was a lot of conversation on the website about it, uh, was the Star Wars Battlefront beta. Yes, indeed. I, I played... I don't know, a good solid three days ago this, I guess. Uh, what uh, what platform? I played right? on PS4. Okay, I played on PC. Oh, well, this is good. This will, we'll we'll yep. kind of get to cover at least two bases. Yeah, I probably put in, I probably only put in a total of maybe four hours in the game. Uh, I think I think I'm more than that. I think I'm probably closer to eight. Okay, and I uh, let's start with your general impressions. Brett. My general impressions is that the game looked great. It re- phenomenal. It looked fantastic on PS4. Ran really smooth. I I got to play like all of the game modes that that were available. The, the, all two of them, the, all three of them. The, the co-op, the, like the co-op survival mission, the uh, like whatever, like the five on five, or like, I guess it's like eight on eight death match, and then like you know the twenty on twenty uh, Hoth ATAT thing. And, I'm assuming I'm assuming by death match you mean the uh, capture point. Yeah, one, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The drop I, zone. I'm, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. The because uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're just playing it's not it, death I mean, match, now that I think about right, it, that's it's, right. It's if you're playing it that way, you're one of those assholes no, who doesn't care about the objective. Yeah, the the eight on eight control point thing, and then uh, and I also got to play the survival mission uh, local co op split screen with uh, with my buddy Ace. Oh, nice, so, nice. I played that one single player. Yeah, so I, I got to uh, I got to really you know check out quite a bit of what uh, what the game had to offer. Initial impressions are that it looks fantastic. It feels very, very much like, um, I mean, it feels like, you know, like Star Wars. Like, it's, it, it, like, I have to tell you, like, the first time that I saw, like, you know, the stormtroopers, you know, running up the hill towards me on that, uh, that Tatooine <laughs> survival mission, I got a little bit giddy. It's like, this is awesome. And then I started shooting them in the face. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree with you, Brent. It looked phenomenal on PC. Um, sounded great. The sound was great. Yeah. Um, M- music actually uh, worked really, really well. Yep, I agree. And I got to say, the I was I was pleasantly surprised by the UI. Uh, I thought by uh, in so far as it was very unobtrusive, I didn't even notice the UI. The one issue I had was on PC. The and I don't know. I'm curious to know what it was on the uh, console, but mm-hmm. the uh, three whatever they're called power up cards yeah. or whatever those were mapped by default to the number keys one, two, and three. Uh, and that was very, and, and they're changeable, so you could customize them if you yeah, want to. I didn't really. Awkward placement. I start, yeah, it was awkward placement. You don't. It's just not as a first-person shooter player on PC, which I I do a lot of. It's not uh, normal to launch a grenade by pressing number two. Yeah. Um, but it is remappable. It was just yeah, very awkward. Usually, but that's other like, than like that, an the, R or an F or something like that. Uh, or I, it's usually a lot frequently mapped to the middle mouse, or it's an F. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah on on so, PlayStation, those are a lot more sensible. It's it's the L one and R one bumpers. For, uh, like, yeah, like the yeah, yeah. you know, like like the it's kind the of two. like a triangle, like those are like the right, bottom yep, left, yeah, right. the two side cards, and then the yep. middle one is is a uh, is a long press of the triangle button. 
of the triangle button. Okay, yeah. Um, like so, but I thought the UI when I had when I had um, when I had uh, um, seen uh, gameplay sessions of Star Wars Battlefront, I really was put off by the UI. There's something about it just looked like. I don't know, like '80s ish to me or something, but I, but I didn't notice it at all while I was playing. Yeah, I I would agree with that. It's also been kind of interesting to read some of the commentary on. I can't remember where this appeared. If it was on PC Gamer, uh, but somebody was talking about how Battlefront felt like a PS2 era game in that it really it really achieved a lot of the a lot of the modern conventions of things like Call of Duty and, and even Battlefield, which might be surprising, you know, given that EA Dice is making it, but that it, it really steps away from a lot of that and kind of goes back to a more simple kind of of multiplayer first person shooter experience in it, just in terms of like how the how the power ups work, how the the uh, the upgrades and things like that work, you know, getting points to to buy different cards with you know better weapons or unlock things like the jump pack and stuff. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I think that what they did was they made a relatively simple, they made a relatively simple game. It's not like a super, super complex first person shooter. And I think that the entry point therefore is, is much broader. I, I think that it's easy for a wider range of people to get into it and not feel as intimidated as playing multiplayer battlefield or COD can to the uninitiated. So let me ask you before we go further, did you have fun? I did. I had a great time. I had a fucking yeah, so great time playing it. Were you reading the website throughout the beta? Uh, I, ch- I checked a few times, but I, I was not. I was not reading up on it all weekend. I, I would have to say it was overwhelmingly uh, to the tune of probably ninety yeah. percent negative. Um, uh, and I also had fun playing it. Uh, I don't. N- I don't n- know if I'm going to pay sixty bucks for it or not. Right. Um, but I had a, I had a lot of fun playing it. People were talking about. Uh, I, I th- again, I thought it was gorgeous. I agree, it was it was very simple. There were there were some things about it I didn't love, like uh, you know somebody referred to it as, uh, and I actually thought it was a pretty apt description. Uh, referred to it as either the spawn die simulator or the get shot in the back simulator. <laughs> there, there's um, a lot of sh- there's a lot of back shooting. I've I, and- I discovered that that if if you start getting shot in the back and you don't have the personal shield, probably gonna die. Probably yeah, and I, you die. know, there's, there are, I think there's balance issues in the in the game that I experienced, and it's unfortunate because, uh, or EA EA Dice offers you that little like I don't know, if, I assume they offered it on the PS4 as well, that little questionnaire, that little survey or whatever, mm-hmm. um, asking you about the game, but they give you these choices and there are these canned choices. And when I did the Need for Speed beta, it linked you out to a website and you could actually type in feedback yeah. and so forth. And so almost all of the feedback I felt like I was giving wasn't what I wanted to give, but there was no other option. Yeah. Other than going and registering their forms, which I wasn't interested in doing, but um, uh, I thought there were some balance issues. I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't love. I, I thought some of the level design, particularly, and, and I understand it. it. It is sort of the planet is on Hoth, um, but uh, I thought, you know, there was some there's some such vast wide open spaces that it was very hard to cover those spaces without getting shot. Um, so I, I thought there could have been a little bit more done to create some more bumps and stuff. Um, I also felt like. The once people learn to fly the Tie Fighters and X Wings very well, one thing that was missing uh, in any kind of real way that was present in Battlefield was a ground supported anti air campaign. And so you pretty much like to to take out a Tie Fighter. There were uh, ground to missile smart rockets, but it was a power up, a pickup. So you had to get the pickup to do it. Yeah. Um, as a, there as wasn't, opposed to like hopping in a turret, uh, or uh, or um, well, you couldn't. Uh, I didn't find a turret you could hop in. Well, I mean, that would yeah. Act- there, there are turrets on Hoth that you can you can jump in and th- that you could actually shoot at the at the. I, you couldn't well, the ones I jumped into, and I jumped into several. You couldn't angle up high well, yeah, enough that's, to that's really. What I was going to say like I never got in a turret and had like the opportunity to shoot at any aircraft stuff. So I, I don't know if they allow that or not. I just knew that there were. I, I didn't see any anti air turrets. I would assume so that that, that, you- that would be you know that would be the most logical thing to do. Or the other thing that would make sense to me is a uh, one of your card choices could be an anti-air weapon, like yeah. a lock-on missile. The way it was, the way you could do that loadout, for example, in Battlefield. And so you didn't... I felt like if you were in a TIE fighter, you had to have an X-Wing to counterbalance it. Otherwise, uh, they could they could fly for just for a long, long time. And as people maybe picked up the rocket, yeah. uh, they could attack them. But there, I felt like there should be an alternative where you could have your own rocket. Right. Um, that So you could actually mount an anti-air team on the ground. So I think there were some balance issues like that, for sure. Um, but, uh, uh, I had fun playing it. I never, Rowan, I like 
was all over the 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 uh, website saying that she had just like could not get in on PC and, and was having all these technical issues. And I have to say, this was one of the most for me uh, one of the most streamlined, well performing multiplayer experiences on PC that I've ever had. Yeah. Like getting into matches was very very quick, and the turnaround times once they were loading was insanely quick and I felt like it was really well done in that regard. Yeah, I have to say that it was an it was an exceptionally smooth experience on PS4. I I think the only the only glitchy thing that happened at all. I mean, like load times, you know, get, getting into parties together, you know, going into rooms, all that worked out pretty well. The only like really weird glitchy thing that happened is on the Hoth level, a couple of times uh, my friend Eric and I tried to like walk behind the the big at at walker we tried to like run behind that walker and and get to something else and in its wake we ended up like falling through the floor and oh, it wasn't yeah. like an endless fall but like in like we dropped down i don't know like like maybe we're supposed to be like in the you know in the big at at footprints or whatever but it was like really glitchy and weird and you couldn't run out the only way to get out was to jump pack out oh that's interesting which is if you don't have a jump pack yeah well th- th- i mean yeah. that was the only way that i was able to get out and i think i think yeah. i think he might have been able to affect some sort of uh affect some sort of extrication for himself yeah i so i i thought i actually had a really good time brent and i thought it was very simplified i i don't one of the reasons i don't know if i'm going to get it is because i highly doubt my friends the guys that i play fps's with yeah. will get it because my guess is they're going to consider it to be oversimplified right. Um, and it was simplified, but I still found myself having a lot of fun playing. Well, it. That, that's me. I, I, I thought that I thought that it actually felt, uh, in the way that it simplified, it actually feels a bit more like like Battlefront, you know, did because Battlefront was made in that era, you know, prior to the the gargantuan explosion of 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 FPSs as this you know this huge huge uh, genre. And um, I, but but interestingly enough, like my decision to purchase or not also comes down to the same thing. It's like, will I be able to play with my friends? Because playing with my friends was exceptionally fun. And if I'm able to do that consistently, then yeah, it might be worth picking up the game and, and having fun with them. But if I, you know, if I can't, you know, carve out enough time to like really justify it, I'm not interested in just playing the game with random strangers or not as interested. Do you think, are you, do you think your friends are going to actually get it? I don't know. I mean, I, like, like we're all kind of feeling each other out. Like we're all kind of playing that dance of, well, what do you think? Are you going to get it? I'm like, well, I don't know. Are are you going to get it? And like, you know, <laughs> we're all like waiting on the other person to say yes, so that we can feel like, yeah, yeah, we'll get it. But uh, everybody, everybody that I've talked to at, does kind of have that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe everybody's a little bit gun shy about it. So I, I would say that the bottom line is that I had a, I had a lot of fun playing it, but I I don't know if that's going to translate into a purchase yet or not. And it, it will largely come down to whether or not I can convince you know, maybe two or three friends who I think I can play with consistently to get it as well. Like if we, if we all kind of agree, yeah, we want to get it, we'll jump in on it. But you know, everybody kind of said the same thing, which is, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's fallout four, there's fallout four, you know, what do I do? Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, you know, I also just to, to sort of wrap up the battlefront, um, discussion, I also did feel a little bit Brent, like, uh, we've seen now three of the four locales, Right, the only location we haven't seen at this point is Endor. Although I'm very interested in Endor and speeder bikes, um, but uh, uh, yeah, there I felt like you know a lot of people on the website talked about how there's not enough content or whatever, and I feel like we we only saw two of the basically the multiplayer modes. There's seven other modes or something like that, which yeah. is you know for it's the same as what Battlefield came out with, which uh, Battlefield came out with ten maps. I'm sorry, but you can assume with nine modes that there's going to be nine. Like it's not they're not all going to be on that same part of Hoth. Mm-hmm. They'll be on different parts of Hoth, different parts of Tatooine. Um, and so, and I believe they just today, and I think we'll talk about it next week, Brent, detailed all of those modes. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, I had a good time. I actually, uh, you convinced me I, I'm going to go download the beta on, they extended it by one day. Yeah, so you can still play uh, it. So it's extended now till uh, tomorrow. I don't know what time, um, but I'm, I went out and I'm going to download on the PS4 just to see what it looks like on the PS4. I'm curious. Because if you're looking for someone to play with, and I'm looking for someone to play with, and nobody's playing that we know, they play on PS4. That's right. I've just never played a first-person multiplayer shooter on a console before. Well, it'll be uh, it'll be an interesting experience. But I, I mean, I think I I think honestly that the beta was it was a really really good exercise both for for players and for EA alike. I think if they can address the spawn camping issue, which there is kind of a spawn camping issue, 
if they can, you know, if, if they can set up, I don't know, like on the Hoth level, it'd be easy. Like, you know, everybody's kind of starting from their, their bases and they've got, uh, you know, they've got like automated turrets or something that would just, you know, cut down anybody uh, from the opposing team that tried to get to that point. But if they could kind of address that in some reasonable way, uh, I, I think that would, that would be the, the main thing for me. I mean, like, you know, not being able to like turn around quite fast enough, you can adjust the sensitivity on the controls and that honestly could use some tweaking where, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit slower in the middle of the, uh, the thumbstick, but when you get to the edges, it's a little bit snappier so that you can spin around. Uh, but it, the game is so fast paced and that, you know, like the respawns are so quick that I don't know. I didn't find myself being particularly demoralized by, you know, oh God, I got shot in the back, you know, cause you respawn like instantly. And then, you know, you're right back where you were after, you know, a few, few seconds of running. I don't know. It, it didn't, it, it didn't, uh, destroy my appreciation for it, but I can, so I can I, understand that some people were frustrated. Yes. Yeah. I want to, I want to hear from the rest of the listeners that we heard a lot of people that didn't like it. I'm curious if there's others out there that did like it. I had a good time. All right. So, yep. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, the next thing, the uncharted Nathan Drake collection. Sucks. No, that's not true. Luke. No, <laughs> that's just simply that's not, not true. true. So, uh, I played a little bit of it. I, uh, I started, of course, with the original, uh, uh, Uncharted, Uncharted Drake's Fortune. Uh, and uh, I have to say, man, so I, I played the demo. I downloaded the demo for the Nathan Drake collection. And honestly, I, I didn't wasn't that impressed. And I was like, oh, geez, am I, this, I don't know. It didn't seem like that big of a deal. Uh, so whatever. Cut to now. I download the game. I started playing it. it Nathan, it looks phenomenal. It looks incredible. Yeah. I, was, I was amazed at how good it looks. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting to feel like it looked so much differently, and it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it does feel dated. Uh, the combat is, is uh, you know, compared to combat we have now, and like, you know, in The Witcher and other games, it's... it's uh, not, not as refined. What's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, no, I think the word is terrible. <laughs> um, but uh, immediately, the, the content, the quality of the... Of the um, of the storytelling and the voice acting really just blew me away, man. And so I played it for like half an hour and I actually consciously went, you know what? I don't want to play this right now. I want to wait so I can play the three games like leading up to it's so good to be back in that world. I want to start playing them sometime in January, honestly, uh, and play them yeah, leading up to the release to in March. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens over the next couple months with other games. Like, you know, if I get fallout, just cause, uh, Assassin's Creed, that type of thing. So I may find myself playing it sooner. But I consciously sort of said, I don't want to get lost in this world right now. I want to get lost closer. But it was it. The, the <laughs> what I did play was was phenomenal. <laughs> I want to get what? lost, but just not <laughs> just not now. Not now. That's right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Well, I tell you, one of the other uh, one of the other games that I picked up and played was Transformers Devastation. I say picked yeah. up. I rented it from Redbox for a day. Yeah. Uh, just to just to see what i thought about because i thought it looked really really cool but i wasn't sure given given the kind of action game that it is i wasn't sure if it was something that would really appeal to me as a gamer and i have to say i had a great fucking time with it i mean you know it's very much straight up action game focuses you know like really on uh peaks and lulls between you know combat encounters you know stringing together combos power-ups and stuff like that it's cool, but it's got the, I mean, it's got the vibe of the cartoon. It's got the vibe of that 80s cartoon series that, you know, which is where I discovered and fell in love with Transformers so many years ago. And, of course, you know, having so many of the original voice cast back really, really cements its kind of legit flavor. Uh, Chris Lotta is, is, still, is still sorely missed uh, as Starscream, however. But, um... It was fun. I mean, it was like really fun, and I, I thought the pacing was good, and it had, you know, just I mean, like that's the thing. Like it had about as much story as the cartoon did, in that the Decepticons are doing something that's destroying some, you know, little little part of the Earth, a city, or you know, whatever, and the Autobots are there to stop them. And really, what else do you need to know? I, I mean, like that is really <laughs> that's really that's, that's really it. it. Uh, although the, the, the cartoon what was actually did have some really good storylines in places, but there were plenty of episodes that that was all that was going on. And then it was just action. The fights are cool. And the, I, I think the action is well paced. There's enough stuff to do in vehicle mode that it, it feels fun to, you know, to go into vehicle mode and then out of vehicle mode. I love the way that they incorporate vehicle mode, like in combat and like how you can, how you can fight, 
you know, fisticuffs and then transforming, you know, into the vehicle mode and then, you know, wind up into some, some new, new combo string and stuff like the combat feels pretty fun. I do think that this is something I'm going to pick up. I think I'm going to wait a little while because I have enough on my plate now. And if it comes down in price a little bit, that'll make it all the more, all the more uh, tantalizing for me. But, uh, I, I had a good time with the game. I'm just not ready to, not ready to get it just yet. That's awesome, man. It was I a wanted great it. rental. That's awesome. I don't, but it's, it's not a full price game, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a sixty. Well, I, I don't know. Let me go look at Amazon real fast. I'll tell you. I, ha- I something tells me that it's not a full price game, but I could totally be wrong. So while you're looking that up, Brad, I'm going to tell you yep. the game that I thought might surprise you this week. Yep. Uh, and that is, I got back into some Splinter Cell Blacklist. Yeah, that 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 is uh, definitely not one I expected to see uh, show up on the in the list again. Completely, uh, it's a fifty dollar game. It's a $50 it's fifty dollar, right? Yes, yeah, so I thought it was a little bit less. Yeah. Um. So, uh, right. yeah. So I um I have a friend of mine. This is kind of random, but who had surgery recently, and he hadn't played games in a long time. He and I used to like game together just nonstop ten years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, he needed something to play while he was recovering. He's like, "So, what should I play that we can play together?" And I said, "You know, there's some great games out there, uh, and Splinter Cell Blacklist is one we could play together in co-op. And I think it's only like twenty bucks right now on Steam, or fifteen bucks. And so he bought it." Uh, is totally loving it, uh, and we played together. We played co-op together, and I, I played it for the first time using a controller on my television um, and uh, just had a tremendous, tremendous amount of fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not. I mean, I, I have nothing new to say about it except that it's a w- really well-designed game and one of the best Splinter Cells I've played in a long time and totally loving playing it again. You and I played it together a little bit. We did. We, 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 we played Blacklist quite a bit when it first came out, and we were... Yep. We were stymied by the uh, by the online issues. We could almost never get uh, online uh, multiplayer co op working. That see, we had we had trouble getting it, um, like actually figuring out how to do it. Mm-hmm. But once you and I had a problem, like making it work. Yeah. Uh, uh, my buddy and I struggled on figuring out how to do it. But once we figured out how to do it, and part of the reason for that was because I was using a controller on the PC, and the controller wouldn't ex- uh, take me to the UPlay overlay, allowing me to accept the friend invite. Yeah. Uh, but uh, once we figured out how to do it, uh, it worked seamlessly, and well, it, w- it worked very, very well. Obviously, they've addressed the issues that we faced way back. When. Yes, two two years later. Yes, which yes. is nice to know. Yes. Uh, uh, so. Yes, you got one more. I have just uh, very briefly to report that after uh, between 130 and 140 hours, I have finished Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain Chapter 1. Uh, and now I'm on to Chapter 2. I've, I've, I, think I, I still don't think I've hit the 50% complete mark. Uh, I've, I'm like 47% complete or something like that, but I have finished Chapter 1. And it was a big honking blowout of a climax and a finisher, uh, like this massive, <laughs> massive blowout of a climax. Infiltra- thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this massive uh, <laughs> base infiltration mission that I just gorged myself on. I had such a good time. Uh, Wait, doing, so how many chapters are there? Uh, there's there's only two, uh, I believe. Although, oh, okay. from what I've read, it seems like there's there's files and things like that people found in the PC version that indicate. There was a chapter three that got abandoned at some point, you know, whether that's related to the Konami Kojima fallout or, you know, what, I don't know. But right. anyway, uh, there's two chapters and I'm on, I, I'm like at the beginning of the second chapter now. And I, I don't know if it's going to take as long to get through uh, the second chapter as it did the first, but it, it's astounding to me that I have invested this much time in this game. And basically, I'm only halfway done with it. And, and I mean, honestly, I couldn't be happier about it. I mean, like, I love the game so much. I, I wish it would go on forever. Uh, that 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 would be just fine with me. We're we're we're, we're, both, we're talking about the same game here. right? Oh man, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm just so I'm just kidding. It. That's awesome. So I didn't know. I, I didn't know that there were two chapters like that. You wrote MGS five finished on the document. Well, no, you'll notice I used the uh, I used the tilde in front of finished. Which mathematically I, 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 I means I thought that was an accident. No, 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 no almost no. finished. Ma- mathematically, you know, that means like, well, it, you know, it's it's close to this. So gotcha, gotcha. That was mostly just to kind of preserve the surprise for you. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I know how much you love that game. I'm very happy for the fact that you're able to see st- see what for some people is a steaming pile of shit. <laughs> and actually, I'm just I'm totally kidding. Uh, that's awesome, man. Uh all right, let's uh let's head on into the sunset, Brent. You know, we did the ride along up in the uh 
uh, up in the clubhouse. So we're just going to do our, our Into the Sunsets this week. And this week, I will start off with um, this I thought was really interesting, Brent. And I don't, I, I'm curious, did you know this before seeing this? Did you know this before now? No, I did not. Yeah, so I did not either. And so it turns out, this is an article I linked to, it turns out that uh, the person who's doing the score for Assassin's Creed Syndicate is somebody who you might have heard of. Oh, yeah? Uh, who's yes, that? his name is Jesper... Ki- no, it's not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Austin Wintry, uh, the <laughs> famed Grammy-nominated composer yeah. of the soundtrack to Journey, one of my favorite musical talents in the world right now, uh, is scoring... Assassin's Creed Syndicate. And you know, Brent, I think when we talked about Assassin's Creed Syndicate last week, you know, I said I, I'm not sure. I can't put my finger on what it is about the game that's making it so attractive to me, but there's something about it that's making it very attractive. And after learning this, uh, I, I think I figured out part of what it is that's making it so attractive relative to other Assassin's Creeds. And, it, it, and honestly, I, I feel like it's production value. Um, yeah. Certainly part of that is the graphics that come on the new gen consoles. You know, they've got wet streets now, which nobody had before next gen <laughs> consoles, uh, which is awesome. So certainly the graphics are part of that. But the other pieces of the production value that I really feel like stand out are the voice acting and the dialogue that I've heard up to this point, from especially from the two lead actors, but even from some of the other main characters, mm-hmm. uh, sound like um, among the best I've heard in the series and sound fantastic. Uh, and then... Uh, unknowingly, you know, I, th- I felt like the music was different, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And now I feel like I can't, I, I feel like an idiot. And I feel like, how did I not hear that? If you go watch, uh, Austin has posted, uh, some, uh, of the song, a couple of the songs to his SoundCloud. Um, and you can watch some of the trailers and you can hear his music over it and just hear how different it is. And I just thought, I just thought how, just how awesome it was that he was doing this. And it makes me, uh, even a little bit more intrigued to pick up. Assassin's Creed Syndicate. So there you go. I thought I'd share it with you. Sweet. Yep. All right. What do you got? My end of the sunset is short and I like sweet. It. I like it. And that is that uh, that Firewatch now like has it. a release date. We have found yes. out that this uh, this intriguing title is going to be out on February 9th, 2016, for Windows, Mac, Linux, and of course PlayStation Four. Uh, yes. I love everything that I've seen of Firewatch. Uh, Firewatch so far. It seems very interesting and evocative. I can't wait to uh, to check this game out, which we will be able to do in just a few months. Yes, and I would assume they said in the announcement of the date that we will they have more info coming soon, and so I'm excited to get more info on the game, including they said uh, the ability for some people to get their hands on the game uh, a little bit early. So I'm hoping there might be a demo of some sort. Yeah, which would suit me, as opposed to I don't know, like a paid demo or you know, like a microtransaction <laughs> demo, uh, one of those or things that we don't like. Pre-order to get the demo. Yeah. Uh, all right, Brent. With that, I think we are going to uh, wrap it up as usual. We want to hear from everybody in the community about anything we talked about on the show today, whether it's Firewatch, uh, Austin Wintery scoring Assassin's Creed Syndicate, Metal Gear Solid Five, Splinter Cell Blacklist, Transformers Devastation, Uncharted: The Nathan Drake Collection, and by all means, sound off on your experience playing the Star Wars Battlefront beta. Likewise, we talked about in the clubhouse the need to keep talking about things that upset us in microtransactions in particular. Sean Murray on the Colbert Rapport, I mean on Late Night with Stephen Colbert, Allison Road, Fallout 4, Limited Edition Loot Crate, and of course the reveal of Far Cry Primal. We want to hear your thoughts and all of the things in the gaming industry that you're interested in talking about. As usual, he is Brent Adams, I am Lauren Baumgarten, and remember, you don't stop playing because you get old, you get old because you stop playing. <laughs>